we have um, Asanka Abbasingh. And I'm not sure if we have Asanka with us yet. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, so Asanka is the Chief Technology Evangelist at WSO2. Um, and he's worked uh, over 20 years of industry experience designing and implementing highly scalable distributed systems. Um, and he's a committer of the Apache Software Foundation and a regular speaker at numerous global events, uh, as well as many technical startups and meetups within the San Francisco Bay Area, a place I'd much rather be right now. And so please welcome onto the stage, Asanka Abasinya. Thanks, Ian. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening uh, from wherever you are joining. Uh, so uh, uh, unfortunately, I had to do this session during uh, unplanned trip so uh, please excuse me if you hear any background noise i'm in the middle of times square new york and the subway is very close to me uh, so um, i'm the chief technology evangelist at wso2 and uh, wso2 we are providing api management integration and uh, identity and access management solutions, but I'm not going to talk about WS2 too much today. Um, uh, so if you are interested, you can go and visit the website uh, WSO2.com uh, and we have a booth in this event as well. If you are interested, you can go and uh, talk to my colleagues. So today, during next uh, 25 to uh, 30 minutes, what I'm going to do, walk you through this concept of uh, quantum duality of API as a business and API as a technology, because um, a lot of organizations are uh, focusing on API programs, but they are looking at one aspect of this problem, either business side or uh, either technology side, but we need to have a balance. So that's where uh, I'm going to discuss and share uh, some of uh, my experience working with uh, a different type of enterprises around the globe. So if you look at the overview, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, on four areas. Uh, first thing about the federation and uh, the business models around APIs, and then, um, how this uh, polygot and heterogeneous nature affecting API development. And from the technology side, how you can move to the cloud and leverage uh, cloud native technologies and how you can modernize the development. All these four pieces are tied uh, with a successful API program. So uh, I'm going to uh, discuss about uh, uh, these concepts. So uh, before jumping to the APIs, uh, let's look at this concept of a supply chain because that uh, connects with uh, some of the business models we are discussing on the APIs. And supply chain is really uh, important to produce um, a product or a service. And it's uh, talking about the production side of the uh, this product or service development or uh, distribution side of the uh, service development. And in some cases, both are as well. So if you look at the supply chain, it has changed with the digital uh, products and services we are consuming as well as we are providing in the current uh, market context. Uh, so the traditional supply chain, uh, it contains the sourcing, manufacturing, distribution, sales and consumption type of uh, flow. Uh, but the digital supply chain is completely different. It's about the discovery about the ideas going into the development. Then you go into the deployment and a consumer will come and register for that particular service or the product and they will get an experience. And once you once they take the experience, they will provide the feedback back to the product team and it will go in this iterative cycle. That's how the uh, current digital supply chain uh, looks like. And if you look at the new product experience, uh, again, it has changed uh, that even you can buy a car online today uh, by configuring different kind of features. And most of the experiences comes through an app that you go to uh, App Store, like Apple, Apple App Store or uh, Android App Store, and then download these applications and quickly get that uh, experience by uh, swiping your credit card. That is the new product experience is happening. So how these products are built? 
So these digital products are built by using an architecture. Either it can be a centralized architecture like you see on the left-hand side of the screen, or it can be a, a decentralized architecture that you can see on your uh, right-hand side. But if you carefully look at these two diagrams, you will see a different type of layers in the left-hand side connected using APIs and different type of components in the distributed architecture connected with APIs as well. And here I have categorized them as utility APIs, domain APIs, and edge APIs based on the behavior and the capabilities that they provide. So uh, if I repeat what I said earlier, the digital products are built using these type of architectures and APIs are enabling this application development. So if you look at the evolution of the APIs, it happened like this. Uh, we started with technical APIs in a very uh, isolated manner, and then uh, it moved to more semi-technical APIs with different type of uh, distributed computing technologies like COBA, OLE, OLE2, COM, DCOM uh, type of technologies came in, I think, uh, late 90s. Uh, and then we moved to service-oriented architecture and we had web APIs with that. Uh, and in 2012, 2011 timeframe, this new concept of managed APIs came and we are now at the API products. So API, uh, since the digital products are creating by consuming these APIs, we say the APIs are the products of 21st century because core of this product development happened through the APIs. And if you have a rich API exposed uh, through your uh, API program uh, and providing your business capabilities through these APIs, developers can build applications and provide a seamless experience for uh, the users who's using your uh, products and the services. And there are different type of uh, API models that we have. Um, so it's about direct monetization, uh, indirect monetization, combined physical digital, and uh, how it creates the backbone for digital. So direct monetization, basically uh, the applications will uh, provide the capability for the consumers and they will uh, use it like you are buying uh, a product or a service through an application. And then uh, in direct monetization, especially in the banking sector or um, aero sector that uh, they will do different type of transactions and then the uh, connected car type of concepts are coming under combined physical and digital and the larger uh, uh, digital transformation platforms are using api as a product to combine digital uh, transformation initiatives as well those are few uh, sub categories that we can see when it comes to api as a product but products need an ecosystem because without an ecosystem you can't uh, leverage uh, the uh, full power of the apis because uh, in today's uh, business models uh, isolation doesn't work you need to connect with your partner network and then uh, other uh, uh, counterparties that will help for your business. That's where the ecosystem coming into the picture. In some cases, some of these organizations, even they connect with their competitors as well, and then uh, get this uh, ecosystem uh, capabilities into the consumers uh, through APIs. And the marketplace is a really good example uh, to do this exchange. So a marketplace uh, is different from a typical API store because people ask this question, what is the difference between an API marketplace and an API store? So my answer is it's like a typical um, uh, marketplace that you see uh, in your day-to-day -day life. It's an exchange, like you have uh, multiple producers and multiple consumers. In an API store, it's a single producer and multiple consumers. So that is where uh, this uh, exchange happen and there are conversations and it is an interesting place than a, a one-sided um, API store that you will find in uh, most of the places. And when you have these um, uh, marketplaces, you can create this multi-part multi -part business models by using that. And the first uh, category is called the internal federated marketplace that one consumer will provide all these capabilities and push it to a 
market, API marketplace. And it can happen through different uh, business unit inside the same organization. Um, and the second category is the partner marketplace that the producer will provide set of APIs and then the, their partners will provide some set of APIs as well. And all these APIs will go into a common API market. And then another category called the closed group marketplace. That's basically you don't expose all these APIs uh, and uh, the creation of APIs to public. You will pick certain set of trusted parties and allow them to do certain activities who can uh, create APIs, who can consume APIs within your marketplace. And shared revenue marketplace comes with how you share the revenue and depending on who's the producer, you will have a plan with them and the monetization of the APIs will connect with that particular agreement that you have with your API partner. And the aggregated marketplace, basically, you create a common marketplace, common public marketplace that all these different type of parties, you and your partners, we publish to the same uh, public marketplace and allow the consumers to use these capabilities. So those are the uh, five type of marketplaces and business models associated with that. So if we take one example, uh, like if you take a financial institute, um, using this uh, partner model and the ecosystem capabilities, you can provide a seamless experience for your end users because bank can connect to uh, third party providers like payment gateways, mobile wallets, and then uh, new uh, credit cards, so and so forth, and uh, provide that single uh, experience for the end user rather than they have to switch to these different type of uh, uh, service providers. So it's a single um, experience that they are getting through the uh, capabilities that you are providing from your financial institutes. And another example on telco, one example is a, a telco can aggregate, uh, create aggregated marketplace by uh, combining different type of uh, APIs that they provide, as well as uh, another partner of the same telco uh, can take those APIs, they can recreate or uh, kind of com uh, re recompose some of these APIs and provide it as a capability to their customers as well. So those are two examples how you can leverage these business models. And if you go back to the physical uh, uh, supply chain and uh, the API supply chain, you can see a, a really good connection like uh, product lifecycle in the physical supply chain map to API product management and ERP and financial systems that manage the physical uh, API and govern the physical uh, uh, supply chain can map to API insight and the monetization. And the supply chain management uh, can map to API integration and enablement as well as logistic in a physical supply chain can map to API DevOps and management. So we can see a parallel and a good relationship in between these traditional models and API uh, models that we'll see in the market. And then as I explained earlier, this cloud native uh, technologies and how you use the cloud native technologies and uh, what is the role of the API uh, can highlight here. Uh, so if you look at the traditional way of using stuff as well as how you can use the uh, cloud native technologies, you can see the uh, 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 see the relationships in between and most of these relationships are built on top of the APIs. Like you run the stuff in containers and uh, most of the time on a platform like Kubernetes and then um, uh, API uh, led a decentralized integrations because you are moving from uh, layered architecture into a more decentralized architecture. And you will see APIs everywhere, like from the utility level into domain level, into edge level, different type of APIs we'll see. And then you will bring more edge gateways into the uh, picture and you can secure this stuff like that. You can leverage the cloud as a technology and uh, in, improve your API program uh, for the better and uh, scalable usage. 
And the API federation is another uh, area that uh, we have to look at because if you carefully notice, API gateways are becoming a commodity. Uh, as I, uh, as you can see, there are multiple uh, gateways that I have listed in the right hand side of the screen. So these type of API gateways can uh, provide that API exchange capability, uh, but uh, it is uh, more than that because you, once you have a proper API marketplace, end-to-end -end API lifecycle management, monetization, those type of uh, core API management capabilities and allow uh, these different gateways to connect to the same uh, system, you can have this multi-part business model on top of that. So that creates a lot of flexibility for the developers, as well as uh, if you look at a larger enterprise, different uh, groups might prefer to use different type of gateways based on the APIs that they expose, as well as based on the um, their uh, preference of the APIs, because now even APIs are uh, getting into different categories, like technology-wise, you can categorize them, uh, like res request response type of APIs, event-based APIs, streaming APIs, and there are different uh, type of uh, uh, protocols available with that, like HTTP, then you will get GraphQL, uh, and now the latest uh, uh, standards are going with uh, more event-driven type of APIs, uh, like async APIs, so all these, things can uh, can be considered when you are picking this gateway but uh, the beauty of uh, api uh, marketplace and uh, multi-part business model is that you can connect any of these type of uh, uh, different type of api gateways and uh, leverage uh, those capabilities within the same business model and uh, if we kind of uh, summarize this concept now, uh, the first section is about the federation and business models that we looked at. So how it is happening, basically, uh, federation and multi-part uh, capabilities are coming into the picture. That's where the heterogeneous uh, APIs are coming. Uh, so you can create different kind of APIs that will support the technical uh, capabilities as well as your uh, business capability, so how you can deliver value by using different type of business models. And then the uh, governance across different uh, uh, API layers that you have or different uh, API deployments you have with multiple vendors coming into the picture. And then uh, based on the business model, you might need different monetization capabilities, as well as you should be able to create new uh, monetization capabilities across that as well. And uh, the technology side, we talk about the cloud, how you can leverage cloud. Then we talk about Kubernetes containers and uh, the automation is playing a huge role. Now, if you look at the API lifecycle, you can map the API lifecycle with uh, the automation capabilities and take an API from creation into the um, uh, the API into a production um, uh, setup by using automation, and you can add various uh, testing and verification capabilities. So when you are looking at API management system, the programmability is the key because programmability is the one uh, enabling automation. So uh, how much uh, things that you can do by you calling a system API of the API management platform you are using uh, will depend on the level of automation that you can use. Then you need to take a look at the scalability as well, because as I explained earlier, the applications are depending on the APIs. And in case, if there's a sudden increase of usage of your application due to some kind of a condition, it can be a market condition, or it can be some kind of a uh, nature related condition, uh, based on that your application usage might go high. So how you can scale based on that, as well as when it comes to uh, the uh, less usage of the applications, how you can run a minimal infrastructure, those kind of things can help with uh, uh, by uh, using a cloud infrastructure. Then the polygot and heterogeneous capabilities are uh, 
really important uh, because you can't stick to one standard as i explained earlier uh, like you might use graphql async apis grpc and then uh, other protocols like kafka nats uh, based on your need and the system should support uh, to cater all these type of protocols and then different type of apis and it has to support aggregation and integration as well because integration is really important because not every backend system uh, supports api or they don't expose the api ready um, endpoint from those systems so you have to do a lot of integration and create a meaningful api for the application developers to consume is where the aggregation and integration come. Sometimes you have to create new APIs by aggregating set of APIs as well. Uh, so that's basically what we call as the API composition. Then the modernization development uh, methodologies and techniques are really important, like how you can leverage things like uh, uh, micro gateways, especially when you are in a decentralized environment, you have to use this micro gateway and uh, the uh, technologies like service mesh data mesh those type of uh, things how you can use with your api program because if you can't use the uh, that type of technologies with uh, the api platform that you are using you have a, a bottleneck there and you can't incorporate those architecture styles architecture patterns as well as the implementation related uh, uh, things uh, based on the flexibility you get from that platform. And we talk about automation and then CICD is part of that. And how you can unify the API development is another thing that you need to take a look. That's where the standards will come. So if you can have a, a standard-based approach, then you can have a proper unified API development experience. Then uh, technologies like serverless, and I repeated about Kubernetes as well earlier. Uh, so uh, how you can use these type of technologies as well as we never know what will come in the future. So what are the extensibility that you will have in your API platform is a dependency as well. So that is basically how you can connect this uh, API business models with the API technologies and then have this balance because if you put more weight into one side, you will not get uh, uh, the maximum out of it as well as you will not have a successful API program. So as an API strategist or an API project manager who's responsible for the API program, you have to look at both these two sides and find the balance and it's uh, really hard to say like uh, what's the correct path because uh, it totally depending on the current landscape from the business models as well as the technology maturity that you have so you have to analyze it and then look at the maturity model and have a proper way of increasing uh, or improving the business models as well as improving your technology stack uh, as well so these are some contributions uh, from my side. As I wrote a detailed article about uh, this concept. You can take a look at that. I have put the URL. And as I explained, WSO2 as a technology provider, we have a, a full API lifecycle management supported product called API Manager. It's a fully open source uh, API management uh, platform that you can download and try. And we are currently working on a complete cloud-based uh, API experience called Corio. Uh, so it's in beta stage. You can register for that, and you will see most of the capabilities that I explained in this platform as well. So if you like to continue this discussion, uh, you can take a look at my blog as well as you can connect with me uh, on LinkedIn as well as Twitter, and uh, we can uh, discuss uh, uh, this topic in detail and I'm happy to guide you uh, in any area that uh, you want to discuss um, as well as if you have active program and you would like to uh, incorporate some of these concepts, I am happy to uh, discuss those things with you as well. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take uh, those questions since we have a little bit of time. And uh, 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 thank you for uh, joining today. And uh, if you have any questions, I think you can uh, send it to the chat. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to answer those.
Thank you, Asanka. Perfect timing. Um, yeah, any questions, uh, feel free to put them into the chat uh, with, with the um, uh, video. Um, <clears throat> with the API as a, as a technology viewpoint, obviously, if you think about the technology side of things, Asanka, when if you're building the, the, the implementation as a new uh, application or a new business capability, it's it's relatively straightforward to think about the API first. I guess a lot of um, organizations will have a lot of um, COTS applications in their um, building that they want to expose the business value as APIs more of, and that's yep. a bit more of a different challenge. I guess, do you have any tips and tricks as to how you approach when the yeah. implementation of, the, of an API is, is locked away inside a COTS application somewhere? Yeah, so I think, Ian, it's a great question. So I would say uh, uh, it has to be API first. I completely agree. But uh, before that, we have a step that is the consumer first or outside in approach. Look at what your consumers are looking at and then uh, look at the APIs, whether these APIs are already exist. If not, you have to design those APIs and then look at how you are going to fetch uh, the information required to support those APIs, like the systems and the subsystem. Because a lot of people do this uh, approach in the reverse order that they look at the capabilities already exist in these systems and subsystems and data, create an API, and then ask people to use it. And some cases, um, some organization that I know, they have uh, hundreds of APIs, nobody consuming those APIs because of this problem. So uh, that the consumer first will naturally tie the API program into the business model as well, because that is what your uh, consumers are looking at, right? So that way you can have a meaningful uh, set of APIs as well as you can add value to the value chain of your organization by using your APIs. Wonderful. Okay. Um, uh, and I guess if, because obviously with a lot of APIs, it's really about how do I make something that's reusable by configuration? Um, and ultimately, if the if the COTS applications themselves haven't thought about how to make something that is agnostic of the business process or of the consumer, is there any particular um, way that you would um, look at how to uh, work with those um, COTS applications as opposed to when it's a, a greenfield and you've got the backend implementation to build yourself? Yeah, so I think uh, the composability of the enterprise uh, uh, come with the API. So that's API is the glue. Uh, and it is not only the greenfield, it glue with the uh, brownfield, as you said, uh, these kind of legacy systems. So what you can do actually, depending on the integration points your backend system is having, either you can just put an API gateway on front of that particular backend systems and expose those capabilities. But if you don't have it, you need some kind of a domain services layer or kind of a, a conversion layer that will yep. convert those backend capabilities and expose them an API. The way you create an API ready endpoint and use the API program to expose those capabilities. And I think that's a challenge. That's why I highlighted integration is tied with API management. Without integration, you can't have a proper uh, API program because the backend systems are really complicated and we have to deal with that. Totally. Well, thank you very much, Asanka.